Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Direct, we beg you, O Lord, our actions by your holy inspirations, and carry them on by your gracious assistance so that every prayer and work of ours may begin always with you and through you be happily ended through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit. St. John the Apostle. St. Maximilian Kolbe. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. This is repeated over and over again in Revelations uh, 2 and 3 uh, in reference to what the Spirit is saying to each of the various churches that, uh, that these, these letters were being directed to. Um, and these letters, these uh, proclamations of the Spirit to, to these particular diocesan churches were exhortations and <coughs> corrections and encouragements to the early Christians who were suffering, as I said, under persecution. And so in St. John's Gospel, there is this ongoing struggle between the, the light and the darkness. And this is one of the most fundamental themes in in the Apocalypse, indeed, in all of St. John's writings. Um, the Apocalypse is kind of hard to put together. It's very complex. And uh, Scott Hahn points out that many <coughs> scripture scholars sort of try to impose upon it a kind of structure in order to be able to interpret it, but that doesn't always work out very well. But one thing is very clear. Um, it is a liturgical text. And the first part of the, the book is sort of like the Liturgy of the Word, where these letters are being sent to the churches and where the scroll is being opened and there's all these proclamations. Uh, the Word is being spoken to the church. And then the liturgical aspect of it continues with the Liturgy of the Eucharist and the, and the, um, the wedding feast of the Lamb and, and, the, and the glorious presence of Christ in his church and the renewal of the church through, through the victory of Christ, which we celebrate in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But one of the other themes that sort of structures the apocalypse is the conflict between the light and, and the dark. But this doesn't only find itself in the apocalypse. It also is a, is a fundamental theme in, as I say, all of St. John's writings, including the Gospel. In fact, it is... Um, uh, this theme forms the prologue to St. John's Gospel. You know how uh, St. John is represented very often as the, as the eagle, the evangelist who takes the form of the, 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 the creature in, in Revelation that, that, is, that is an eagle. That's because St. John's uh, account of the life of our Lord is so theological. You, you know, it, 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 it lays down the principles of how we are to understand who Jesus is and why he came. And that's why you have this long section in the first chapter of St. John's Gospel that we call the prologue, and that for those of you who remember the old Mass or sometimes attend it, you know, it's said at the end of every Mass, the prologue of St. John, proclaiming that Christ is the light and that he shines in the darkness. In him was life and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Uh, that's the, sort of the last part of, um, uh, of, of, of the part about the light, but he goes on. He says, this man came, gave a witness to give testimony to, uh, of the light that all men might believe through him. He was not the light, but was to give testimony of the light that was the true light which enlighteneth every man that cometh into the world. So Jesus is both life and light 
and he comes into the world and shines in the darkness and he drives the darkness out. And the response of the church, which is represented in the prologue by St. John, who is the prophet of Christ, you know, the last of the great prophets and the one to announce the coming of the Lord and who represents for us in this passage, you know, the church in general, uh, he gives testimony to the light. He's not the light, but he gives testimony to it. He is a, a martyr for the light. And, and this is what we see played out uh, in the apocalypse, for example, in towards the very end of the apocalypse in chapter 22, and the night shall be no more, and they shall not need the light of the lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord shall enlighten them, and they shall live and reign, for, they shall reign forever and, and ever. So what does this opposition between light and darkness mean? Well, in, in the apocalypse, you have uh, two, two different ages represented I said you know, that there's things in the past that are represented by, by the images in the apocalypse and, and things in the future, but um, there are two concepts that you see throughout, throughout the apocalypse that, that help to give us an understanding of its structure and correspond more or less with the light and the darkness, um, and that is the present age and the age that is to come. All right? So, Saint, Saint John is speaking to the people of these churches, the angel, God is speaking to, to these churches, to, the, to, to this present age in which there is conflict. And the promises of an age that is to come, and it is you know, the light of the age that is to come that is shining into the darkness of this present world and enlightening it and chasing away the darkness. So on the one hand, there is this opposition between the light and the darkness, obviously, between, uh, between the spirit of this world and the spirit of Christ Jesus. So there is this opposition. And, and yet the opposition is being overcome by the light entering into the darkness and driving it out. So already in the present <coughs> age, the age to come is already present. You, you know, the, we are being invaded by the angels, the holy angels. The, the world is being invaded. You know, the, 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 in, in Revelations 12, the, the, the tail of the dragon sweeps a third of the stars from the sky uh, and, and they fall to earth. And, and this is, you know, represents the fall of the angels. But now through the battle that began even before the creation of man, heaven is invading the earth and it begins with the incarnation but, and, and continues with the passion, death and resurrection of, of the Lord. But now the, 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 the line has been drawn and there are those who stand with Christ and there are those who stand uh, against Christ. Saint uh, Ignatius of Loyola talks about the two standards, the standard of Christ and the standard of the devil, the standard of the world and we have to choose sides. But already at this moment, there is this, this um, uh, invasion of the, of the present age with the world that is, is to come, and the presence of Christ uh, is, is with us. So that's a major, major theme of, of the apocalypse that runs throughout and helps us to understand what is going on. But corresponding to, to the light is also um, uh, is, is life. And it's, this also is both in St. John's Gospel and in Revelations. In, uh, the, first, uh, in, in um, the fourth verse of the prologue of St. John's Gospel, the first chapter, uh, St. John says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So what does the light bring? The light brings uh, life. Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, comes not only to enlighten, but to give life and to give it for all eternity. Um, and this is uh, through, throughout um, uh, the apocalypse. Um, Jesus comes who is to live forever. Uh, he is the son of man, himself is the first and the last, the living I was dead and behold I, I live forever. That's from uh, the first chapter of the apocalypse apocalypse. The, the kingdom and life are identified 
uh, in, in the apocalypse, and they shall reign forever with Christ in chapter 20. Um, and, and then at the end of, of the world, death and hell are thrown into the lake of fire and destroyed. Um, and, and as I said, in the end, there will need, there'll need be no need for a lamp nor the light of the sun, for God will enlighten all, and they shall live forever. Um, so the whole of the apocalypse is this, this encounter with conflict and death, the threat of death, the threat of utter destruction, and yet the promise is that the darkness will not overcome the world, will not overcome those who follow Christ, and that they will share fully in, in, in the light. Now that's the theme, but unfortunately, um, we don't always choose the light. And, and there's no guarantee that we will. Um, the human drama is such that everything hangs in the balance. You, you know, God loves us, he creates us out of love, he redeems us out of love, and yet there is this ongoing conflict between the light and the dark, and nothing is determined except by our own choices. And that ultimate, ultimately, in the end, our salvation will depend upon our choices. So the liturgy of the word in the apocalypse, in the apocalypse comes in the form of this uh, preaching of penance, really, like in the gospel when Jesus comes out uh, proclaiming the kingdom of God at, at hand and calling people to, to repentance. This is what is done in the second and third chapter of, um, uh, of, of Revelations. And you can read about the seven, seven churches in the letters uh, that the Spirit speaks to these churches. He that has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. So what is the Spirit saying to the churches? Well, to Ephesus, uh, they are reminded that they have abandoned their first love. This is in chapter 2, verse 4. And um, uh, St. John, or the, or, or the angel, tells them that they need to do penance, otherwise their candlestick will be removed from its place, which is a sign of, of um, the presence of those who worship God in spirit and in truth. So they, they will lose their place at the table if they don't return to their first love. And remember, Ephesus was the diocese of, of St. John. To the church of Smyrna, he says uh, uh, this was a church that, that would suffer persecution, but they were exhorted not to be afraid, but to be faithful because a crown, the crown of life, the crown of life awaited them. So they were about to be persecuted, but they were to not, to, not to be afraid, but to be faithful and, and await their crown. Pergamum, uh, the church that needed to repent, they were being called to repentance and uh, they were told that if they didn't do penance, he, that, that the Lord would come and, and make war with them with the sword of his mouth, that he would come and speak against them if they didn't do penance. Uh, Theatira was the church that had a false prophetess in their midst, and they tolerated her. In fact, um, in, in verse 22, uh, they are told that they're like, they're like adulterers. They commit adultery with, with her with this uh, false prophet. And if they don't stop, if they don't repent, they will have great tribulation. The false prophet will bring doom upon them. Uh, to the church of Sardis, this is a church that had fallen asleep. This is the passage where our Lord says, you have a name that says that you are alive, but in, in reality you're dead. You've fallen asleep. And if you don't be vigilant, if you don't wake up and be vigilant, I will come as a thief when you know not. So this corresponds to the preaching of our Lord in the gospel where he tells us to be awake and not to be asleep because we'll come like a thief in the night when we least expect it. To the church of Philadelphia in um, chapter 3, verse <coughs> excuse me, 7 to 13, this is a church that endured patiently in trial. And our Lord promises them that because of their fidelity, they will be kept from temptation, but they're exhorted to hold fast, to hold to their patience, because a crown awaits them as well. And Laodicea, uh, also in chapter 3, is the famous church that was lukewarm. 
and fa our Lord found them insipid and wanted to vomit them out of his mouth. And, and that, was, that was the threat uh, to them. So uh, I, I just want to read, uh, continuing on, on what, our, what is said to um, Lao Ducha, it gives you an impression of, of the character of, of the exhortation and correction that is, and encouragement that is be, being given to these churches. Because thou sayest, I am rich and made wealthy and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy me of me gold, fire tried, that thou mayest be made rich and mayest be clothed in white garments, and that the shame of thy nakedness may not appear. And anoint thy eyes with eyesalve, that you mayest see. Such as I love, I rebuke and chastise. Be zealous, therefore, and do penance. Behold, I stand at the gate and knock. If any man shall hear my voice and open to me the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that shall overcome, I will give to sit with me in my throne. As I also have overcome, I am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. So this exhortation is very powerful because it's, it's uncompromising. Our Lord is not letting any of them slide anywhere. You know, no, no fault is being left unturned. He's not giving them a pass because times are difficult. <laughs> Remember, <coughs> this is a time of persecution. It's very difficult at this time to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ. Even, uh, in, you know, is a threat to one's well-being and, and life. And yet our Lord is not ignoring any fault here. He's, he's, he's <coughs> coming upon them with a searing judgment of their deeds. And, and yet he is, the, 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 the rebuke and the punishment associated with the rebuke is remedial. It's not punitive. He's not there to punish for the sake of, uh, of, of simply exercising it, a, a blind wrath like we do sometimes. We lose our temper and, and we, are, we are punishing towards people or towards you know, whoever because we've, we've lost it. Our Lord hasn't lost anything. Our Lord is, is applying the necessary medicine as um, difficult to take as it might be. But at the same time, he offers uh, encouragement. Such as I love, I rebuke, and I chastise. Be ze therefore zealous to do penance. I stand at the door and knock. And then he makes this promise. I will, anyone who opens to me the door, I will come to him and sup with him and he with me. And he that shall overcome, I will give to sit with me on my throne. All right. So this is the way our Lord behaves towards the church's under persecution. This is the way he behaves towards the churches in crisis. He is present with them as, uh, as a father is with his children. He does not abandon them. He does not leave them to themselves, but he doesn't leave them uncorrected. He corrects them, but he promises them his continued presence and consolation and the grace that they need to do what he's asking them to do. So he places a heavy responsibility upon his followers to persevere in the midst of these difficulties. Um, you know, and that's the nature of our relationship with God. You know, Scott Hahn, who has written this book on, on Revelations, is of course, as many of you probably know, is really big on uh, covenant theology and, and spirituality in which you know, God offers us uh, his presence and, and, and uh, this family relationship, but you know there are promises made on both sides. God promises to be with us. God promises us to, to give us grace, but we must uh, be faithful to our side of the covenant, which is to love him as a father uh, and to, to obey him and, and to persevere uh, in, in that obedience. And you know, in the last analysis, that's the how we will be judged. You know, the, the, the apocalypse and 
as I was saying last night, you know, this this period of the liturgical season at the end of the end of the um, liturgical year reminds us that that our time is limited on this earth, and that we are headed for a final reckoning, uh, and, um, <clears throat> and, 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 and that the judgment of God, in a certain sense, already begins now. You know, in the end, it'll be definitive, and we'll be given what we deserve to receive. Now, the Lord behaves towards us like a father towards his children. And very often we suffer, we find ourselves in difficult circumstances because it's the medicine we need. Not We shouldn't think of it as punishment, but we should think of it as divine providence. God, God deals with us as a father. Um, and his providence it sees the whole picture. So when, when the Lord speaks to the churches uh, of, 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 the, of revelations, He's speaking from the point of view of the world to come. He's speaking in the, to the present world, but from the point of view of the world to come, as the one who has conquered. You know, uh, in, in read the first chapter in which our Lord comes as the Alpha and the Omega. He's already the Son of Man who, who reigns in heaven. And, and he, calls, he calls the churches to repentance as the one who is victorious asking them to do what they must do, but not leaving them to, to, to their own devices, but giving them the grace, grace that they need. So um, that's what the Spirit says to the church throughout the whole of history. It is this call to ultimate fidelity to Christ and to, to repentance. Um, and yet there is an ongoing conflict. There is this conflict between this present age and the world to come, between the light and the darkness, it's ongoing and it's never easy. And we are living, trying to live in the light in the midst of darkness. And sometimes we feel as though the darkness is invading, you know, the, our sanctuary. And sometimes it is. The sanctuary is sometimes of our churches, of our society, and our homes, you know. And, and it's a constant effort to, um, to drive it away. Um, and that's why I want to <laughs> take a few moments, <coughs> take, take some time to look at something that I think is, is, is helpful uh, to, is helpful to um, understanding <coughs> if I can just figure out what's going on here. Okay. Um, helpful to our understanding of, of, of what the Spirit is saying to the church in the midst of this conflict and this effort to overcome uh, the darkness. It has to do with um, Pope Benedict <coughs> and um, some of his, his, his great work during his pontificate. Uh, you know, uh, some say that Pope Benedict is kind of a a, a transitional pope, and 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 that's true. You know, he he was chosen. Technology is just a nightmare. <laughs> it's supposed to be helpful, but sometimes it's just not. <laughs> um, so um, so he, he he you know we we say he's a transitional pope. He was chosen at the time of Saint of of will soon to be St. John Paul's uh, a death because he stood head and shoulders over everybody else. It was a pretty obvious choice. He had been with the, with the previous pope for so many years, and he had an understanding of, of what was going on in the church, you know, and, and had his, 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 his finger on the pulse and, and, and was just, you know, an eminent pers person and a hol holy man that God had put in that place and made him an obvious choice for for the successor of, of John Paul. And yet he was very old, you know, and, and he, even at the time of his election, it wasn't something that he was looking for. And his, his brother, George, said, you know, was, you know, that they were hoping that he could go off to Bavaria and have a nice quiet life, and it just didn't turn out that way. And now we have Pope Francis, because Pope Benedict prayed a lot, you know, that 
thinking that maybe God was calling him uh, to, to, to abdicate after he had done all that he could. And he had thought about it for a long time and had prayed about it for a long time. But you know, he's ma he made very many wonderful contributions to the life of the church in the, in the, in the short time, that relatively <coughs> short time uh, that, that, he was, um, that he was pope. One of, the, one of his major contributions is, is this idea of what he referred to as, as it's popular, popularly referred to now as, as the hermeneutic of continuity. Have, is it, has anybody heard about this, the hermeneutic of continuity? Hermeneutic is a fancy word that means interpretation. That's all it means, it's, or a principle of interpretation. How do you interpret something? So hermeneutics in sacred scripture is how do you interpret the Bible? All right, so he's talking about how do you interpret something? In particular, what he was talking about was how to interpret uh, the Second Vatican Council and the whole post-conciliar crisis that occurred over the last 50 years. He, he, he talked about this principally in a um, conference that he gave to the Roman Curia on uh, December 22nd, I believe, uh, 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 2000. And five. Every year the Pope gives a Christmas address to all the members of the Roman Curia. The Pope does that all every year. And uh, on, in 2005, he talked about what he called the hermeneutic of continuity in this form. The basic idea is that um, was what I was talking about last night, the, about avoiding the extremes of this sort of uh, uh, naive utopianism, opti optimism, or this, this crazy utopianism that, that somehow there's going to be a new age and that everything is going to suddenly become wonderful and we're not going to have any more problems <coughs> and that we're all, awaiting, we're all awaiting the overcoming of the present tribulation and the restoration of, of, or not really even the restoration, but something beyond anything we've, we've ever imagined in, in this world. The world is going to be restored or, or brought into some kind of, of new, new age. Uh, and, and sometimes this is the idea express, expressly or, or implicitly in, in what people would call progressivism or, or modernism within the church. You know, uh, there was an idea after the Second Vatican Council that the council changed everything, that the church was going to rewrite her doctrine, that you know, that's why there was all this controversy about contraception. There were a lot of <coughs> theologians who thought the church would change her mind on the issue, you know, um, and, and that everything was going to be different, you know, that, that there was going to be this more permissive society that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was inspiring the church to, to, to become relevant to the, to the modern world. So, um, <clears throat> as I said before, Pope Benedict uh, has referred to this as um, a sort of the uh, Kennedy-era optimism. Pope Francis, in, in context of religious life, has called this, um, this adolescent progressivism, you know, a kind of immaturity that thinks that I, can, I, I know better than everybody else and we can just throw off the past and, you know, sometimes the way teenagers, we've all done it, you know, think that their parents don't know anything and that they're going to reinvent everything and, and they have a better idea about everything. Uh, this, is, this was present in theology and spirituality and of course it was a disaster. You know what I mean? People optimistically and, and enthusiastically went into churches and whitewashed you know, all, the, all the images and got rid of the images or whitewashed the, the frescoes and all that thinking that they could come up with a better idea of what a church is supposed to be. And, and we've suffered the consequences and people generally realize now that this was largely a mistake. But on the other hand, um, uh, Pope Benedict was, was warning against the opposite extreme, which is uh, that the church is constantly in decline and that we always have to be pushing backward to get back to where Christ wants us to be. And the reason I bring Pope Benedict up because of, you know, he, well, what he's saying is there's continuity between the church before the council and after the council. There's only one church. There's no pre-conciliar church and post-conciliar church. Uh, there's only one church. 
and the church must go forward, but she must go forward in continuity with her past. This is one of the reasons why Pope Benedict you know, made a much more liberal use, allowed a much more liberal, free, and this is what I mean by liberal there, free use of um, the old rites, or the, what is called the extraordinary form, so that we could have a reconciliation with the past. It's not a denial of the new liturgy or saying that the new liturgy is no good or that the old one is better. It's simply that we have to understand that there is ultimately one church and that there's one liturgy and that all liturgy, whether it's celebrated in Latin in a more mysterious way or in the vernacular in a way that, that people find more accessible, that it's still the same reality that, that, that is uh, the world to come entering in, into this present age. Um, and I say this because this, is a, this, this problem is a very old problem. It's a very old problem. You know, there have been utopians from the beginning. And there have been those who you might call uh, traditionalists, you know, who, who, who want to want to stop the church in her tracks and stay where they are. And the reason, reason Pope Benedict is sort of an expert on this particular problem is because he's known for um, uh, a, a book that he wrote when he was, I think, Archbishop of Munich and a professor there, which is called The Theology of History of St. Bonaventure. And I don't want to go into all the, the technical aspects of, of his ideas, but, but there have been some theologians who've said that, this, that, that his, his understanding of St. Bonaventure, who's a great Franciscan doctor of the church, whom uh, we as Franciscan friars love and, and venerate, uh, his understanding of St. Bonaventure is really a key to his pontificate and what he was trying to do. Because in the, in the Middle Ages, the Franciscans sort of went off the rails very early on in their life, already in... Um, already in the 13th century, you know, in the first few generations after, the, after St. Francis had died, they went off the rails because of this doctrine of a man by the name of Joachim of Fiori, who had been a uh, Cistercian monk. And Joachim had said <coughs> that, there, that, that there was going to be a new age, that history was divided into three ages. There was the age of the Father, which was the Old Testament, the, the age of God's you know, wrath and, and, and the written law. And then there was the age of the Son, which is the age of, of the church, in which God reveals the Son to the world and establishes the church and the sacraments and the priesthood and all that. But there's a coming age, which is going to be the age of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, there'll be no need for the sacraments anymore, no need for the church or anything like that. It's going to be a new age. And he said that there would be a prophet of the new age, and that prophet would establish a new kind of monasticism, different than the Benedictine tradition that was prevalent in the West at the time, of which Joachim of Fiori was a part. And so when St. Francis came, some of the friars thought that St. Francis was this prophet and that the Franciscan order was this new type of monasticism. So they went really way off the rails. And this is one of the reasons why... Uh, there were many controversies about the Franciscans and Dominicans in the 13th century. There were a lot of secular priests who didn't like the Franciscans because they thought they were crazy. Some of them were. But they wanted to, they wanted to get uh, St. Bonaventure and St. Thomas Aquinas out of the University of Paris, and they really wanted to get rid of the friars generally because they thought that this was really a bad thing for the life of the church. Because St. Francis, when he came he actually did create something new. Prior to uh, St. Francis, all religious were monks, okay? We're not monks. Sometimes we refer to ourselves as monks and, and we say a monastery, but we're really not monks or friars. It's different. The monks live at a monastery and they, and they have a vow of stability. Their abbot is like a bishop and the, ab and the, and the abbey or the monastery is like a diocese and the monks are attached to the diocese and the bishop, to the monastery and the abbot. And they're not supposed to go anywhere else. I mean, sometimes they travel and whatnot, 
but their whole life is attached to this monastery and to the abbot. And that allowed them to live a particular kind of life, to have the solemn liturgy celebrated every day. You know, the monastery and the land that they had and, and all of the, their ability to provide for themselves by, by planting and harvesting and making whatever, wine and all that type of stuff, allowed them to do what they needed to do, which was to celebrate the liturgy. And around these monasteries grew up Western civilization. Around the monasteries, uh, uh, you had the towns that were built. The monks educated the people, handed on, in a, in a time of great illiteracy, they handed on culture to, to, the, to the faithful. Well, in the 13th century, there was an inspiration of the Holy Spirit given to to individuals like St. Francis, also to St. Dominic, but in a particular way to St. Francis, who felt inspired to live a more evangelical way of life, not attached to a monastery, but moving from place to place, like I talked about St. Bernardine, who went from town to town preaching the gospel, didn't really live in one place at all. Uh, we're not attached to a monastery. We can be sent anywhere at any time. And the reason was because there was a need at that time for a new kind of dynamism within the church, a missionary dynamism that would eventually develop you know, in, in the later centuries into the whole missionary effort of the church to, to re-evangelize Europe and to go to the New World. But it all started, in a way, with St. Francis. But, um, but when, it, when this new kind of monasticism did emerge, as I said, some of the friars and other people said, wait a second, this sounds like they're following Joachim of Fiori and that they're, an, they're anti-church, that they're against the church. So St. Bonaventure, what he did is he, 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 he drove a middle course. He drove a middle course between the sort of progressives of the 13th century that were, were going down this utopian kind of line and between them and the sort of traditionalists who are saying, no, no, you can't have anything but the old style of monasticism. This new style of monasticism is no good. It's, 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 it's just going to destroy everything. We have to go back to the way things were and get rid of all of this. And Pope Benedict, in, in some of his writings on St. Bonaventure, has used this as a key to understanding the present moment. That, that we have to run a middle course. And the middle course between these extremes in the world in which we live today has to be a restoration in part, has to be a restoration of discipline. All right? This is why Pope Benedict, and I think you'll, you'll find Pope Francis, are concerned with the, the correct celebration of the liturgy, with the restoration of obedience to canon law, you know, getting priests to be better formed, understand better what's expected of them, and also the faithful, to conform more to the way the church is supposed to do things. Yet at the same time, St. Bonaventure and the church today realizes that just restoring the, the rules and discipli discipline, and making sure that there's consequences to people's actions, this is not enough. You know, there has to be a movement of the Holy Spirit. There has to be something that happens within. And this is what St. Francis captured within his order. It was a movement of the Holy Spirit. It was an evangelical movement. And through men like St. Francis and St. Bonaventure, they, they inspired. You know, if you read the life of St. Francis, uh, it's an inspiration. And, and the biographies of St. Francis were written <coughs> very early after his death, and St. Bonaventure wrote one of them to be sort of like a definitive autobiography of St. Francis. And for the friars, the life of St. Francis was an inspiration. It, it gave them an understanding of what it meant to live the life of Christ in the present age. And, and uh, it gave them the internal motivation to do what is necessary to persevere in their vocation and to become saints. And that's what's necessary at this present moment. St. Bonaventure, in one of his famous writings, and this is quoted by uh, Pope Benedict, um, says, um, Christ's works do not go backward. 
They do not fail but progress. They don't go backwards, they, they, but they, they have to progress. But they progress according to the movement of the Holy Spirit within the church. It's within the church. The church is the one who discerns what the Spirit is saying in the present moment. It's always the role of the church to do this. And sometimes it's very difficult and it's very complicated and it creates a great deal of crisis. You know, uh, no matter what goes on nowadays, because of the conflicts that exist and, and, and the complications of modern life, the progressives and the traditionalists are never going to be happy. They're never going to be happy. The, the, the world and, the, and life within this world, within our home and within the church, is messy business. Because in the end, we are followers of Christ by choice. You, you, you know, in the end, nobody can force our hand. Even in religious life, in which we profess obedience, nobody forced us to go to the altar. You know, a shotgun wedding is no wedding at all. So we're all Christians by choice. And this is why you'll find that in the, um, in the writings and, and, and speeches and addresses, homilies of Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, uh, you'll find a lot about the encounter with Christ. You know, that, that we've got to preach the gospel, we've got to preach morality, we've got to fight uh, the, the beast, you know, the beast of, of the secular state and the beast of false religion. We have to fight these things. Uh, and we have to teach the truth. We, ha we have to lay down the law. But, it like, but like St. Augustine, I said last night, you know, he came to an understanding of the truth by thinking things through and by studying the philosophers. He started getting his life straightened out by getting his mind straightened out, getting on the right track. But it wasn't until Christ spoke to him that his life was changed. God said, take and read. There was a book sitting next to him, and it was the Epistles of St. Paul. And he picked them up, and that's what changed him. You know, I read about some other, some journalist last night who, uh, who was sort of secular and probably sort of on the liberal side. They didn't convert to become a Catholic, but they did become Christian. And that's what happened to them. They went and they started, they didn't really want to be a Christian, but somebody took them to somebody that was a pretty good preacher, and they started unraveling some of their secularist ideas and, and this person spoke you know, about the scriptures and philosophy and things and things started making sense to this person. Um, but they didn't want to become a Christian. They didn't want to have to deal with it. They didn't want to, any of it really. But it was something that happened in spite of their, their, their not wanting to do it. Christ sort of invaded their life and, and changed everything until little by little, suddenly, they had joy in the thought of belonging completely to Christ. Something like that has to happen in the world, in individual lives and, and in society. And so we have to try to do both in our, in our own lives. This is what the Spirit is saying to the church and to each one of us, that we have to teach the truth. We have, we have to hand on the faith unadulterated, the full gospel, without compromise. We have to do this, but we also in our own personal lives have to somehow become instruments of Christ in, in the movement of the Spirit. We have to make Christ present in other people's lives by the way we live, by our charity, by our patience. You know, it takes a lot of patience to live in this world, you, you know, and, and to do so as an instrument of Christ. The wrath of God is, is not calling down fire from heaven. When the apostles suggested this to the Lord, you know, he wasn't happy. When the apostles suggested that they call, call down fire on people that wouldn't listen, the Lord wasn't happy with it. That's not the wrath of God in the apocalypse. The wrath of God is, 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 the, um, is the love of a father who does not abandon his children but is not afraid to correct them. He doesn't let them, let them, leave them off the hook, but he doesn't deny them his love either and his encouragement. 
And, and, and this is a, a, a part of, I think, what the Spirit is saying to the Church, and, and, it's, and it's, a, it's a profound message of, of Pope Benedict. I tell this story frequently. Um, I probably tell it too much, but I think it, it says, it says a, a lot about what we need to learn. Uh, less than a year before Pope Benedict, be, um, be, before Cardinal Ratzer, Ratzinger became Pope Benedict, before the death of John Paul, uh, he granted an interview to Raymond Arroyo. It was the only English-speaking interview he did, uh, probably ever, I think. Um, and, uh, and Raymond asked him a number of questions, but he also, he, one of the questions he asked him was about the new springtime of which John Paul spoke very much, that there would be a new springtime in the church. Uh, Pope Pope John the Twenty Third and Pope Paul the Sixth called talked about a new Pentecost that was hoped for because of the renewal of the Church that was supposed to take place because of the Council. And um, and and his answer as to what his take on the new springtime was is he said basically there's not going to be busloads of conversions. I, I don't believe that that's what the new springtime is. He said. The new springtime is going to be, and I'm paraphrasing, but the new springtime is going to be the Church of the Martyrs. He said in the early church, the, 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 the Christians, the followers of Jesus, were a minority of society, and they were harried, they were persecuted, and, and sometimes isolated. And yet, because of their conviction, because of their witness, which again is a very large part of the apocalypse. It's St. John in the apocalypse that turns the word witness to mean one who dies for their faith. We say martyr, which is simply the Greek for witness, and we know what martyr means. But before then, it only meant witness in St. John's apocalypse. That's where the word in Greek that means witness become, comes to mean someone who dies giving testimony to Christ. That's where it takes on that meaning. And he said, he said it'll be from the force of the conviction of those who follow Christ that they will proclaim to the world that the church is the future. That's what happened in the early church when the, when the Christians were a minority. The church is the future. The only future that exists that's worth having is a future in the church. And this is what Pope Benedict believed this new springtime would be. It would be a church of the martyrs. And beyond that, you know, we, we hope for, for, for mass conversions, of course. But what has to come before then is, 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 a, is a church that is renewed uh, because of its, its deep conviction. And that can only happen to us and to others if we somehow have this <coughs> encounter with Christ, which is a movement of the Spirit. Y you know, so when we deal with people, we have to keep this in mind, you know. Uh, we have to evangelize, we have to uh, correct and, 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 and um, uh, admonish, you know. Uh, uh, fraternal correction is, is, a corp is a spiritual work of mercy, all right? To correct those who are in error is a spiritual work of mercy. But we have to do in such a way as, as to be like Christ uh, in these letters to, to these early churches in which he encourages them to, to, to find the grace that, that he wants to give them. You know, so, um, so if the apocalypse is a kind of um, revelation of God's plan for all of history, uh, we have, to, we have to follow this path, I think, <coughs> that Pope Benedict laid out. You know, before, Pope, before St. Bonaventure, the fathers of the church viewed, basically, uh, Christ as coming at the end of time. And of course, there was reason for this because of the things that our Lord said uh, in the gospel and because of the apocalypse that indicated that the end was imminent, that it was imminent. 
that it could come at any moment and that it was likely to come very soon. You know, soon is relative, but to those who are living, you know, soon means in my lifetime. And, and many believe that. Um, and, and so the fathers had this impression that history is, is directed towards Christ, but it comes to an end with, with Christ. Uh, Joachim of Fiore believed that the Holy Spirit would be the last age. And that there would be, like I say, a completely new age. St. Bonaventure said, no, Christ is the center of history. Everything revolves around Christ. And that's the perspective that we're given, that's, that we're given in, um, that we're given in the apocalypse. And it reminds us that we need to cut a middle path. You know, uh, and, and this is the difficulty that the church is experiencing now, trying to cut this middle path is not an easy road to hoe. And I think, personally, I think it's really not all that surprising that there should have been a great crisis resulting from um, you know, not just the council, but that whole era of the, of the 60s in which you had the sexual revolution and sort of this general naive optimism in society about overcoming, you know, just all the problems in the world and uh, and and on all, all the rest of that, that that the church should try to um, take the good with the bad, take the good of modern society and throw out the bad, and try to make this discernment that that people would err on either side, either by saying, well, let's just start over, you know, let's just restart the whole church and reinvent it which is largely what happened, and that others would react against that and say the whole, the whole idea is a bad idea from the get-go. <coughs> it's, it's, it's very understandable that that should have happened and created a huge crisis. Now what, what the church has been trying to do over, over the last 50 years, really, but in particular through the very long pontificate of John Paul II and then through Pope Benedict and his very you know, trying to gather the threads of John Paul's teaching and, and efforts and, and to tie them up together. And now Pope Francis is sort of very much out of the box, you know, and, and, and giving us a different perspective. I don't think it's one that's contradictory to Pope Benedict. And, you know, I could talk about that, but I, I don't have time now. But uh, the effort is to cut this middle road. There's a conference that Pope Francis gave to religious back in earlier part of this year. Um, I think it was in springtime, some, uh, maybe summer. To the religious, to the religious superiors. And he contrasted the, I the idea of this sort of adolescent progressivism that was tried to reinvent religious life. And the result was you had so many religious just leave, go out and get married or whatever and throw off the habit stop teaching, you know, forget their, their apostolates, the reasons for why they were founded, just try to reinvent everything and turn it into a, a wholesale disaster for re many religious communities. Again, adolescent progressivism, we know better than everyone else, we're just going to do it our way and forget everything else. We don't need to listen to the church on the one hand. And then this effort to turn the clock back on the other, on the other hand, that the, the, the problem needs to be corrected by pretending none of it happened, you know, and going back to, to the way things were before the council. Uh, this has been rejected by all the popes since the council. Uh, uh, Pope Francis has said, you cannot stifle the Holy Spirit. You can't put the Holy Spirit in a box, in a cage. There has to be an openness to the movement of the spirit, which is essentially charismatic, which doesn't mean necessarily speaking in tongues, but it means that, that the, the spirit is alive in the church now, in the church, in the church. And again, I go back to this as a, as a fundamental aspect of the apocalypse. The apocalypse begins with Jesus ent uh, uh, entering the picture and proclaiming the word to the churches, but it ends with the new Jerusalem the restoration of the church. The apocalypse is about the church. Restoration will come, our overcoming <coughs> temptations, 
and the world and the darkness are living in the light and receiving the light of Christ will come in and through the church and only in and through the church in spite of the fact that it is partly a human institution with all its foibles. You know, there is the sin of giving scandal. And our Lord says, woe to those who bring scandal. There's also the sin of taking scandal. You know, we can't allow what other people do to, to become an excuse for doing something other than God wills. We have to love the church. You know, we have to, to be faithful to the church, to the Holy Father, you know, and do, do everything that we can to be productive members of our diocese and parishes and to be a, to be a source of unity rather than, than division as much as we can. You know, we, it's, you know it's not, we can't sing kumbaya all the time. I'm not talking about that kind of unity. But, but the church must have unity. We must seek unity within the church. Unity is of value, and not to have unity is a true scandal. It's a true scandal. We must seek the unity of the church. And that, that will happen uh, as we'll talk about, um, well, I guess we'll talk about it now. I've got a few more minutes to do that. Um, <clears throat> No, I was going to talk about it later on. So um, that'll come back. That'll come about through the mystery of the cross. I'll talk about that more in, in the later in the later conference. I already talked about it last night. Um, the answer is always the cross. You know, it's it's the mass. It's our own participation in the mystery of Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection. That is the answer. Other things we're uncertain of. Sometimes we don't know how to handle members of our family. What's the best way to evangelize? We should be all concerned about these things and do the best, and the church is. The church is examining the question of the new evangelization and what needs to be done to bring people back to God, especially those who ought to know better, who are living in Western society and in, in, in cultures that at least at one time were Christian, how to bring these people back to God. We have to be concerned about this. But the overarching thing that's present that we ought to all know and, 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 and appreciate it because there, there is no real question about it is the mystery of the cross and our own participation in that mystery. And if we're suffering because of our family situation or because the state of the world or because of the church, then that is something that we have to, we have to uh, grapple with and embrace according to the will of God and offer as a sacrifice that's pleasing to the Lord. That is the role of a witness of Christ, a martyr. And, and this is what our Lord, <laughs> this is what the Spirit is saying to the church. This is what the Spirit is saying to the churches <coughs> and to the members of the churches. This is how we must return to our first love. This is how we have to wake up and be vigilant. This is how we have to repent and, and embrace what the Lord wills for us. All the things that our Lord is, uh, this is how we suffer a persecution. This is how we reject the false prophets of the world by embracing the cross and accepting it in our lives. Um, because that, that is, that's the state of affairs. That's the apocalyptic state of affairs in a way that, that we need uh, to deal with it. And in a particular way, I'll talk about this in the homily today, but um, also tomorrow in the, in the, co in the morning conference, but um, if there is to be a new Pentecost in the church, if there is to be a renewal, and it is ongoing, I believe it is already, you know, it certainly has already begun, it's just been a difficult process. Um, if there's going to be a reform of the reform, if what Pope John Paul and Benedict and Francis will for the church is to come about, there has to be the presence of Our Lady because Our Lady is mother of the church. Everything the church is meant to be, Our Lady already is in her person. She personifies the person of the church not only because she is the model of the church, 
but also because uh, she is the mother of the church. She is mother and teacher. And she, she is present in the life of the church throughout its history. But I would say in a particular way in our history. You know, the modern Marian movement beginning, you might say, with, with uh, all surrounding the Immaculate Conception, really. Um, Guadalupe, the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe is the woman clothed with the sun. Uh, and she crushes the serpent's head in Guadalupe. You know, that's an image of the Immaculate Conception. Ruta Bach is the Immaculate Conception. The Miraculous Medal is the Medal of the Immaculate Conception. That was in 1830. And in Lourdes, you have, you know, 1858. It's four years after the proclamation of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in 1854. <coughs> I am the Immaculate Conception. And then you have Fatima. All approved Marian apparitions. And then you have great saints like St. Saint Maximilian Kolbe, who understood this mystery. And then you have the great Marian apostle and pope, John Paul II, who, who, who has guided the way, who, who went to Fatima, thanking Our Lady for saving his life when he was shot a year, you know, on, on, our, on May 13th, when a year later on the feast day to thank the <coughs> Blessed Mother. Our, Our Lady at Fatima also is the woman clothed with the sun. You know, on the last day of the apparitions on, uh, on October 13th, uh, she appeared to the three children and she fulfilled her promise. All during the apparitions from, the, from, from May to October, every time Our Lady would appear, Lucia would say, what do you want of me? That was her first words at every apparition. What do you want of me? And, she's, and Our Lady's response was, come here on the third day, 13th day of each month and in October I will tell you who I am and what I want who I am and what I want. And Lucia in her um, memoir, her final memoir, which was her reflections on the message of Fatima that she wrote in 2000 said, on October 13th, Our Lady fulfilled her promise. She told, she told me and, and, others, and the others who she was and what she wanted. Her last words to, to Lucia and the children were stop offending God because he's already very much offended. And then she raised her, her hand to the sun and everybody saw the sun fall from the sky except for the children. The children didn't see the miracle of the sun. They saw a vision that, that, that showed Our Lady of Mount Carmel and St. Joseph. And, and as she blotted out the sun, she was clothed with the sun as she is in Revelations 12. The people on the ground saw this apocalyptic vision of the world coming to an end. And Our Lady, Our, Our Lady stopped it. And when the, when, the, when, when the miracle was over, when the ret sun returned to its place in the sky, everybody who had been wet you know, from the rain were, were dry and, and people were cured. You know, Our Lady has control over the elements. She's crowned with stars and she's standing on the moon. She, she is brighter than, than the moon. You know, she stands in front of the sun. She's clothed with the sun. Um, and, and her place in, in, in history, you know, because really the apocalypse is about history. What do we do in these difficult circumstances? What do we do in society with, which is constantly changing? What do we do when we, when we don't know what to do? How do we solve the problems at the ch in the, within the church and society that are so complicated? Christ is the Lord of history and his mother is the mistress of history. And, and we are being called to have great devotion to the Blessed Mother. You know, the rosary isn't just a prayer. The rosary is a way of life. You know, seeing Jesus through the heart of Mary, <coughs> invoking Our Lady's presence constantly through our in our life. That's the rosary. And it's meant to t teach us a way of life. A way of life. So um, that's what the Spirit is saying to the church. And I think, you know, we could go on with this, but I think that's also one of the reasons why there is a movement to see Our Lady proclaimed uh, <coughs> mediatrix advocate and, and co-redemptrix because it proclaims this truth. 
that Our Lady is, is at the center of history with her son and that she, uh, that God is in control and, and he uses his mother to, to uh, take care uh, of, of his children. And it remains this constant guarantee that while God holds us to the highest standard and, and will punish us like a father, uh, that his compassion is always greater. And the sign of that is the presence of his mother as mother of the church and mother of each of his followers. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for all your benefits through live and reign forever and ever. May the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Father, Son.